Um, while uh, we're waiting for folks to type questions, I guess I just have one here uh, to ask um, Eric Cooley. And when we talk about the runoff measurements that you've seen, in particular the surface water measurements, Eric, has the depth of snow played that much of a difference, or is a greater variable the um, depth of snow underneath manure when it's applied, or is a greater variable, say, that concrete frost or that layer of ice actually on top of the soil? I guess, Kevin, uh, they're really all the same uh, with respect to uh, the magnitude of loss that we've seen. And there is, the snowpack is really, really is where the variability comes in because it's not only the snow depth, but it, uh, it is also, um, you know, the density of that snow. So when we get those early snows at the beginning of the year, they're the nice, fluffy um, uh, snow that doesn't have a lot of water entrained in it. But once we've had that snow sitting on the surface and it's undergone some, a little bit of freeze thaw or it's been beaten on the sun for, or the sun's beat on it for a while, and we really see that, that snowpack, although it might not be great in depth, it really has a lot of water in it. And again, it's the water content of that snow that we, that we uh, think separates that, that good contact um, when we do have snow melt in the spring or ra another rain on snow event that uh, really helps to, to, again, act like roller bearings uh, between that manure and that soil surface. And it, it, it all comes back to the, the contact of the applied manure to the soil surface. If we have good contact and there's some pore space available for those liquid juices in the manure to, to move in and infiltrate into that soil profile, we see losses dramatically decrease. So I see we've got a question here from British Columbia. How many states allow winter spreading on snow or frozen ground? And it really varies. There's a number of northeastern states I'm aware of that have banned the practice outright. For a lot of other states, it's only the large farms that have operational permits from either the state regulatory agency or EPA at the federal level that may have restrictions on winter spreading, but the smaller farms in those states typically do not. I guess the question, Brent, for you here is obviously they're probably uh, not every farmer like the idea of being required to have a winter spreading plan in Brown County. How did that, how did you sell that to the farmers or what's been the acceptance of it by farmers? I think the, the acceptance here has, has been slow. Uh, we, we've sent out, over the past couple of years, you know, we've sent out postcards just for that they need to do a uh, winter spreading plan. And actually, as time goes on here, the, the uh, producers are actually very receptive to it. They don't want to, uh, they want to try and minimize their liability. They want to um, keep their neighbors, uh, keep their neighbors uh, happy, if not somewhat happy. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the ultimate goal here. If a, if a landowner or a residential uh, home or so forth wants us to stay away from it, from their property, uh, we will do so. So, uh, so we try we try and stay away from residences as much as possible. Is, is really really the goal, and uh, our producers uh, seem to understand that. Okay. So, and I guess one of the follow up comments to that, Brent, I think a lot of the motivation around here by producers is we had enough in the mid two thousands uh, television news stories with manure coming out of people's kitchen faucets, uh, video of people running the bathtubs, flushing the toilets, and it looking and smelling like manure in their home water systems. And I think there's a motivation by the farmers in these areas right now not to be featured on the 6 o'clock news and really to be proactive and to take the right steps. Um, I guess the question here for um, Eric Jeschbach as well, and Eric, I mean, you're working closely with a lot of your farmers uh, year-round, but you're also picking up new clients on occasion, somebody you haven't had experience with. And I guess just a question for you, if you were to uh, be asked by a, well, let me put this way, if you had the ability to wave a magic wand and change a farm's crop rotation or change how they do things, what types of things would you change to kind of get things more prepared on the field cropping and the farm scene uh, for a year like this? Well, it, yeah, it depends on the species. You know, here in central Ohio, um, wheat's a, a possibility in the rotation, even if they want to double crop soybeans. You know, 
work with us, and, and we can we can hit it fast enough that they can still double crop. You know, if it's a dairy farm and they get some grass in their in their rotation, um, even alfalfa, uh, and everybody's a little different about putting manure on alfalfa, but we've surely been doing a, a good bit of it. So anything that we can can pick a few days up here and there, especially in the summertime, really helps our workload and, and reduce uh, how much we have going into a wet fall. Okay. Uh, Eric uh, Cooley, there was a question from Ralph Fisher. Uh, were the runoff concentrations that you talked about earlier representative of field with an acceptable uh, manure application plan? Yes, those were applied in accordance with a um, with the nutrient management plan designed for that farm. The caveat being is that the weather played a huge factor in the losses that year. Um, we had in 2005, which was the first year that we had the rain on frozen ground with those losses that we saw in January with the, the applications of those uh, of that little bit of manure uh, during that time period. But then we had a, a, a huge drought in um, during the summer of 2005. Crop yields were terrible, so we think a lot of the nitrogen was still residing in that soil. And at that time, the farmer came back in and applied... Uh, basically, as soon as the corn silage came off, what little value it had, it came on and applied for the next year's corn silage uh, to the nitrogen requirement of the crop for their manure application. So there were almost two years of nitrogen setting in, sitting in that field, and then we had the perfect storm where we had a warm, wet fall. So we got the conversion of all of the manure or all of the um, nitrogen in that manure to the nitrate form and subsequent loss with the, the late fall and, and uh, early spring rains and snow melt. Okay, so we had a question earlier about injecting manure into frozen ground and I know I've worked a lot with uh, my manure applicators here in Wisconsin over the years and I think the depth of frost really depends on the moisture. If the soil tends to be a little bit drier, uh, we can get in there and do some injection. Um, if it's wet when it freezes, it obviously is much harder to get in, and we're only able to bust through three or four inches of frost in order to do the injection. But in those kind of situations, obviously, we're looking at lower rates because the um, soil is not covering manure the way that it would if the soil was thawed. And so there are management options and changes that need to take place. Um, Les Everett has a question here. If risk of early frost pushes application earlier, our cover crops and management tool that can scavenge manure nitrogen? Definitely so. And Eric, I don't know if any of your research has looked at cover crops yet that you can share if you're still too early in what you're doing. Yes, Kevin, we are, we are going to be... Um, looking at cover crops with some of the upcoming research that, we, that we're doing, but we have not been able to quantify that yet with prior research. So we are going to be looking at that, but I don't have numbers to, to share. But we, we do have high hopes that for those time periods where we do want to apply right after corn silage, you have to get manure on fields earlier than those soils cool down to 50 degrees, um, that we can use cover crops or some type of nitrification inhibitor to, uh, to reduce uh, the losses. And I do know that several states have cover crops worked in as a management option in their 590 standard in those soils that are more susceptible to nitrogen losses, the real sandy soils. Uh, Barb posted a question about nutrient management plans aimed at applying most or all of manure during the growing season. I think it's key to remember here that manure's nutrients are available over an extended period of time because they break down uh, in some cases over two years or more whereas commercial fertilizer is almost immediately available. So the, the one of the things that we have to look at is that corn, for example, will use two to four pounds of nitrogen between germination and knee-high. From knee-high to tasseling, it's not unusual for corn to use two to four pounds of nitrogen per day. So in an ideal world, we want to target that nitrogen application to that window of greatest uptake. The challenge, of course, is that manure takes soil temperatures above 50 in order to decompose and the decomposition happens over the entire summer. Ideally, what we want to do to reduce losses is to make that application 
as close to corn uptake or crop uptake as possible. There's a number of companies playing with manure injection in standing crops. There's research that Glenn Arnold, who was on the call earlier, has done out of Ohio uh, that can probably answer this. And maybe, Glenn, you want to type a few things into the chat box as well. Um, otherwise, obviously, that's one of the reasons we don't want to apply manure or commercial fertilizer in August is our soil temperatures are warm enough. We're going to lose a lot of that nitrogen before the corn is useful next spring. So uh, Glenn posted here about uh, the drag line to inject swine manure and corn yields of 226 bushels to the acres. So I know there's some really good work going on there. Um, so I guess the Jill's question here may be uh, targeted more towards you, Brent. How much time do you have to spend in educating those involved in order to achieve the collaboration and level of education? And I can speak from the manure applicator side, or maybe we should let Eric Dreschbach, but what do you think about Jill's question? Uh, you know, I, I, th I think, uh, I guess I'm going to look at it from the standpoint of when I meet producers one-on-one. -on -one, uh, once we get to that second year, these guys are a lot more on board uh, for what's going on here. And, and, you know, we get an opportunity. The nice thing about writing the winter spring plan is we get to talk about their farm uh, and their land kind of thing, and that's really what they're they're concerned about ultimately. So, so if we can uh, work with those producers and help them out in any way, uh, it, it seems to be going very well here so far. Eric? It's uh, an everyday challenge to get the farmers to get on board, but usually once we show them things, they, uh, they come around, and if they don't, they're not one of my customers. Okay. Um, Ralph posted a question about research looking at uh, drag line or tile line discharge in relation to timing. I know that ARS at Coshocton, Ohio, did some work on this uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. Eric, do you have anything from Wisconsin uh, that you want to talk about here? The, uh, I guess I'm not quite, I'm trying to go back up and look at the, uh, at the question here, but we do have a lot of the timing and magnitude of uh, nutrient loss that we've seen in tiles on um, our website, and we've got all that information available. You can easily do a search and look. Um, on, on our website for if you're looking for nitrogen, phosphorus, or whatever else in tile, and we've got those reports available. So if you have any problems finding anything, please, please contact me. But again, I, I can't find the question specifically to what was that being asked. Um, it was Ralph's question, are there any studies related to tile line discharge in relation to application timing? Yeah, oh, I see, okay, yes, and there is, there is a strong correlation. Um, between just like the surface water, we're seeing very similar results in the tile water, especially where we've got very well, um, well developed macropores in the soil, like we see in, in uh, some of the no-till soils, that um, the surface water and tile water uh, timing as well as the kind of the magnitude of loss really correlates well in many instances, although we do see more nitrogen being lost in the uh, in the organic and ammonium form on the surface, and typically we see it predominantly in the nitrate form in tile, uh, again, that can vary based on the situation and the timing. I want to give uh, first Eric Dreschbach and then Eric Cooley and then Brent any, uh, an opportunity for any final comments or thoughts as we wind down here. Yeah, I guess I'll just reiterate the fact that, um, you know, when it, when it comes to the losses, it, it all has to do with the contact of the, the manure in the soil. So any, anything that's going to reduce that contact, we see a direct correlation with the resulting runoff. So um, that really is the one, if you take one point away from anything that I've said today, uh, that should be it. Uh, Brent Peterson here. I guess from my standpoint, uh it's all. It's really a matter of uh, of uh, producers using using the old noggin. Uh, you know, if, if we got a concentrated flow area where it's going to wash, chances are uh, manure is going to go with that and so forth. So it's just it's just a matter of uh, using your head ultimately. 
I think the bottom line is that common sense should rule the day. Obviously, if we can change the crop rotation, pre-plan, get that plan B done months in advance, that's the best way to deal with it. When we don't, then we tap into the resources of the Soil and Water Conservation District, other conservation agencies, and really look at putting a plan together um, so at least before we go in the field, we've got a strategy to know where we should and should not be applying. Uh, we did have a couple of questions that uh, came up here uh, in terms of mineralization at cold soil. Um, and the water budget question, I guess the water budget question I'll answer first and then turn over to Eric on the mineralization <coughs> and soil temperature. Uh, one of the things that's in a lot of states' nutrient management standards is a table that looks at what the water can act, or the soil can actually absorb and the wetter the soil is, the lower the uh, application rate that should be uh, used on the field. So obviously, if my soil is near saturation, uh, my application rate should be lower and my, or my soil can't absorb a lot of liquid. It should be lower than in another situation. Yep, and the composting question, I typed the response here too. Uh, for the most part, those farms that invest in composting are doing it year-round and not just seasonally. Eric, uh, mineralization and temperature question? Right, and I think the, um, um, we really have seen the uh, that 50 degrees, um, when we're when those soils are above 50 degrees, we really do see the conversion very quickly to nitrate. One of the the mineralization question is a hard one. Um, what I can say is the fact that the the concentrations in respect to uh, nitrogen in the nitrate form don't have a real large variance. Uh, typically, we really see that when water is moving, nitrogen in the nitrate a form is moving in the tile water and some of that has to do with the volume of the storm and um, and a number of factors so it's really hard to tease out um, individual things that, and, and look at them independently because there are so many factors that are affecting that but basically if water is moving through the soil we do see uh, nitrate typically in the tile line and I'm not quite sure if that answers your question but um, that's all I can really tell you, to be honest. Okay, so um, <clears throat> is there a fixed rate of nitrogen uh, available? And quite honestly, nitrogen is so variable. That's why we use tests like the pre dress nitrogen test here in the upper Midwest, really to help us gauge what the mineralization rate is actually then uh, in terms of guiding supplemental nitrogen applications. 